Abu Dhabi. The capital city of the United Arab Emirates is a modern metropolis on the Arabian Peninsula, but just to the south lies an area known as Rab al Khali, a stunning sand desert with mountainous dunes, beautiful and peaceful, but also dangerous and very hot. Bikes, cars, quads and buggy drivers will do battle over 1,300 kilometers of unforgiving scenery in a fight to keep their machines moving and minds alert in the race against time to finish fastest. This is quite a challenge. It's the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. Before the rally headed to the desert, the 120 plus competitors were busy readying their highly specialized machines. In time to be put through a vigorous scrutineering process with the officials from the FIM in charge of checking the bikes and quads, the FIA looking after the cars and buggies. The Formula One circuit at Yas Marina was a fitting location for the organizers to welcome the world's media, eager to talk to the top riders and drivers before they head off into the wilds. The 27th edition of this prestigious event showcases the very best in international cross-country rallying, and the man tasked with putting the week's proceedings together was Emirati motorsport legend Mohammed bin Salayam. If we look at the bikes and the cars, we have the best of the two worlds. Um, we have the world champions, uh, we have the big teams, and I believe the whole story is about the competition. I always consider Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, if you look at 300 kilometers of our stages, it's equal to 700 of Dakar because of the demand of, uh, demand of the train. It's not just harder on the, on the drivers, but even on the cars itself. I just hope they understand it's a long endurance here. And one thing I would say, do not underestimate this event and respect it for you to survive. The rally's first action was held at the Al Forsan Sports Resort, where the patron of the event, His Excellency Sheikh Nayan bin Mubarak Al Nayan, arrived to send off the teams as they raced two at a time against the clock on a short, tricky circuit in order to establish starting positions for the first special stage out in the dunes. With recent unseasonal heavy rains, the conditions were very different from the ones they would see for the rest of the week. The Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge acts as the season opener for the 2017 FIM Cross Country Rallies World Championship and reigning 2016 world champ Pablo Quintanilla from Chile was here to stamp an early claim on retaining that crown. He could only set the third fastest time though. Uh, this is my third time uh, that I'm racing here in Abu Dhabi and the first time as a world champion. So sure is something special and, and I will try to, to do my best and have a, a good race. Red Bull KTM factory racing was well represented with three riders, though they were missing 2016 Desert Challenge winner Toby Price, who was out with injury after a recent leg break. Frenchman Antoine Mayo wasted no time in making sure Price wasn't missed by putting down a great run to go second fastest. Though it was teammate Sam Sunderland who finished in the quickest time to give himself the best starting spot for stage one. His winning ways seemingly continuing from his recent Dakar rally win that he'd spent so long trying to achieve. The last six or seven years have been uh, a hell of a hell of a fight to, to keep pushing towards trying to win that race. In anything in life, you know, the more work and the more, more effort and, and sacrifice that you put into something, it, it feels that much more special when it pays off. It's done now, dude. It's back to work. You know, we're here at the, the first round of the World Championships and the pressure's all here, you know. It's uh, time to go back and, and fight again. I want to win. I want to win more than anything. I'm ready. I feel strong. The bike's good. The team, are, team have been working hard and um, we're here to win. Local rider Mohamed Al-Balushi was here once again, looking forward to taking on the top riders in the world in his backyard. Can't wait for it to start. Uh, very excited. Finally, the day is here. I know today is a very short day, but uh, at least you get the road book and you start, you know, with a normal routine, which you will stay on it for the next week. So I uh, can't wait for the countdown to start and we start the rally and hopefully it's a positive step. Another UAE local is Sheikh Khalid Al Qasimi, who set off in the top T1 car category, his new Peugeot 3008 Dakar tearing around the track. 
but could only manage sixth fastest. A slightly disappointing result, but with a new machine, he had a lot to learn. Russian duo Vladimir Vasilyev and Konstantin Ziltsov took their mini all-four racing to third spot on the grid, while the Ford F-150 Evo of Martin Prokop sounded great as it sped around the wet sand track. The Czech driver and his co-pilot, Jan Tomanek, were delighted to go second quickest, surprising some of the onlooking crowd. Nearly five seconds fastest on the day was Qatari driver Nasa Alatia and French co-pilot Mathieu Baumel. An incredible performance in their Toyota Hilux. Though delighted with the result, Nasa wasn't expecting it to be an easy week. We are so happy to be here in uh, Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, you know, after good result in uh, Dubai Baja. Abu Dhabi, it will be a special race and uh, it will be hot, not easy, you know, because you see now it's around uh, 35 or 36 uh, degrees, you know. But uh, it will be not easy for everybody and uh, I have a lot of experience of this uh, of kind, this weather and terrain and we try to do our best, you know, and to win, uh, to be hat-trick. A few hundred kilometers drive south into the Algarbia region of the UAE and this is how the five stages would look. All tough days, though day three stands out as the longest distance in the biggest of the dunes. Early Sunday morning. A featureless plateau at the north of the Liwa Desert began to transform into a hub of international rally activity. Rally officials, timing, medical, TV and branding crews congregated to set the competitors into the gruelling 278km special. The Yas Marina circuit stage one would be of two halves, a fairly fast and flat opening 150km before the rolling dunes build towards the end. Mohamed El Belushi was the first bike into the stage, and for half of it, he was alone. Opening the route is never easy. He was setting tracks for the rest. The fastest riders in the prologue are able to choose their positions for stage one, with the top guys opting to leave latest in the order. Red Bull KTM teammates Volker and Mayo headed off together. And last to leave the starting area were the fastest qualifiers, Sunderland and Quintanilla. The opening miles of stage one were flatter than the riders would see for the next few days, giving the faster bikes plenty of time to pin back the throttle and chase down those that had gone before them. The leading works riders started over 36 minutes behind Belushi, but by the end they had caught and overtaken the UAE-based rider, and the lead group formed of Sunderland, Walkner, Quintanilla and Honda's Paolo Consalves marched towards the finishing line. Right at the final kilometre, Sam Sunderland dashed for the line, finishing a fraction ahead of Chilean Quintanilla to take stage victory by just three seconds. Really heavy, really tough day, it's a bit hot, and um, no, but the bike was working really good. Sometimes it was really soft and you had to always pay attention, but uh, we're here, we're happy, we've got a long way to go, and uh, day by day, but everything's good, the bike's good and feeling good. It's the last part is always like a motocross race, um, Sam did a really good job today. Um, I tried to, to push in the last uh, few kilometers to, to get the, these seconds. So I'm happy, I'm happy with the day, I'm happy with the bike, so uh, feeling good and strong, so it's really good. Yeah, Alexandre Rene finished the day six minutes back in fifth position, while second Honda of Kevin Benavides was a further three minutes behind. 10 minutes cover the top six bikes after stage one with local rider David McBride rounding out the top 10, just 42 minutes off the lead. Stage one had already taken its toll and one of the riders to suffer early injury was Alan Boiter, who's the team manager of locally based Vendetta Racing. He may be already out, but riding the event himself was the least of his responsibilities. Running a private team in amongst the world's best was more than just a hobby. Vendetta Racing was formed in 2007. The core members are myself, uh, Dave McBride, Dave Mabs, Steve Blackney, uh, my wife, team chef, team mother, team everything else. It's, it's a laid back atmosphere. It's got its dangers, it's got its risks. We're all just here for a bit of fun. For this event, for this specific event, um, we actually fantastic mechanics behind us. We actually fly these guys in from the, from the UK. They're all personal friends of ours. Same attitude to racing, same 
same mindset and both races themselves because uh, you need a strong support team to do this event. You, you do get some days which are not enjoyable. Um, my day one was definitely not enjoyable but you muck in, you, you, you support everybody else. It's, it's, it's a great atmosphere down here anyway. I mean yeah, we, we've all been up, stuck in the top of a sand dune sweating, bike, bike problems, whatever. That moments are not enjoyable but then a week goes back and you, you look at the whole event and uh, roast tinted glasses maybe but it's a definite drive to come back again. I, I think the drives it's in the name it's a, it's a challenge uh, and it, it's a fantastic challenge it's a big event it's a world championship event you can actually rub shoulders with world champions and and, and race competitively well <laughs> race in the same competition with them maybe not competitively and that generally doesn't happen in any form of motorsport. The 36 strong car field were made up of three classes, T1 prototype, T2 production and the T3s who have their little one litre engines. First of the top cars to start was ex-world champion Vladimir Vasiliev from Russia. His privately run Mini getting away to a fast start looking to set a good pace for the chasing pack. Unlike the bikes, the fastest qualifying car, Nasser Alatia, decided against being the last away. The 2016 champion set off, hoping to start well on his quest to win their overall third Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge title in a row. The newly painted Toyota Hilux Overdrive wasted no time getting up to pace. Main rival Sheikh Khalid Al Qasimi's poor qualifying run in the prologue hadn't affected his start position too much, and he went next. With local knowledge and experience, he wasn't holding back, blasting through the dunes with little care for the tricky, heavy conditions. Martin Prokop's Ford F-150 Evo had a paint job to ensure he wouldn't be missed in the desert. He was hoping to make a bright appearance in the mirrors of the cars ahead as soon as he could. One of the favourites for the T2 production car category, Emil Kessner, headed south towards the Lima Desert, knowing his Nissan Patrol could handle what lay in store. He was quickly trying to hold off the slower of the T1s as they tried to make up time. This Saluki Motorsport team of Mark Powell and Quinn Evans trying to battle past them side by side. In the T3s, Ukrainian Vadim Pritulak, driving without a co-driver, was running well and set the fastest time in that category. But the brutality of day one was clear. Local favourite Yahya Ali had barely begun when he shredded a tyre and the task of changing it in this heat was a tiring affair. Two-time winner of this event, Vasiliev had suffered air conditioning failure in his privately run Mini and with temperatures rocketing to 45 degrees outside, the Russian was destroyed by the end of the stage. However, somehow he still managed to stay concentrated enough to get the third fastest time. Sheikh Khalid Al Qasimi had maintained a decent but not spectacular pace in his two wheel drive Peugeot. And despite finishing second, he may have hoped for a little better. The four wheel drive Toyota is the car to have in the dunes, but that takes nothing away from the incredible speed of the 2015 and 16 champion Nasser Alatia. At times, he was literally flying. Yeah, actually, it was good run, you know, but it's uh, really very hot inside the cars. It's around uh, 48, 52, you know. It was not easy, but okay, we, we did a really good job, you know. I think we have a good time, you know, compared to the other uh, car, you know. We are quite happy to finish day one with a good lead. The Qatari had wasted no time in laying down the gauntlet and ended the day with an 11 and a half minute lead. It was their title and they were going to keep it. One down, four more challenging days to go. After the break, the rally moves on into the bigger, tougher dunes, a place where even the bravest can be beaten. And we learn just how the competitors manage to navigate their way through the never ending desert. Welcome back to the 2017 Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, powered by Nissan. A six-day cross-country rally through thousands of kilometers of the renowned empty quarter of the UAE. 
Finding your way through one of the Earth's hottest, driest and most unyielding environments is a tough assignment. Every evening, back at their base at the Qasr al Sarab Desert Resort, the task of translating the following day's stage routing was up to each rider. How do you navigate your way through an event like this whilst bouncing through the terrain at breakneck speeds? This is a road book. Everyone gets given the same one the night before a race. I can explain that it's uh, kilometre zero is straight. Uh, the dotted line means it's off-piste, which means open desert, in cap 236, which is a compass heading. Um, and it's based off of kilometres, and then, you know, what, different kilometres, it's different information. At 18.6, we have to turn right at cap 230, but it's not like 4x4 four four tracks, it's just open desert, so that's one way. And then this is a solid line, which will be a 4x4 four four track or a man-made track. We have waypoints that we need to hit, um, and if we miss one, we get penalised. Uh, 20 minutes or more can be up to an hour. If you imagine you need to follow, for a basic example, hunt cap 100, if you're not accurate on that cap, which if you can imagine in the dunes is quite difficult to ride in a perfectly straight line, um, and obviously the bigger the distance, the harder it is to be accurate. If you're a few degrees off, you can miss it. It's really important to, to mark really good the notes when you have some danger or some change of direction. We try to to put some important color to important thing like a change of duration, if it's one dangerous or it's flat or is it a big dune. You do this going as fast as you can. We have a GPS but it's closed, it's never open. It's not like we're following a Tom Tom or something. When you come within a certain radius of that uh, invisible waypoint, it'll open and you need to validate it within 90 meters. It's definitely the boring side of it. Just put the music on and yeah, normally just sit and chill out and, and get it done. But you need to focus as well, you know, because like, for example, if I missed that note, it can be a bad day, you know? It can be the end of your race or it can be worse. So, you know, I, I wouldn't trust anyone else to do it for me because it's my life at the end of the day. The whole of the rally's infrastructure had now moved deep into the Liwa Desert, where His Excellency Sheikh Nayan Bil Mubarak Al Nayan, Minister of Culture and Knowledge Development and Chairman of the General Authority of Youth and Sports Welfare, paid a visit to check everything was ready for the day ahead. The bivouac base alongside the Qasr Al Sarab Desert Resort was home to rally headquarters, the teams, their support crews, rescue teams and the media centre. A whole international event based in the middle of the desert Quite the logistical challenge, but with careful planning, every need was catered for. Sheikh Nayan enjoyed being shown around some of the technical aspects of this event. If day one was grueling, day two would be even worse. More dunes and higher temperatures for the competitors to handle. The Nissan Patrol Stage 2 is 279 kilometers, starting out in the rolling dunes before the rally moves up a gear in technical driving as they take on the steepest of the terrain. The top 15 bikes and quad finishers of Stage 1 would start off fastest first, meaning KTM Sunderland would open the road and set the track for the rest. For the other bikes and quads, they would start in rows of 15, a mass start and a spectacular scene as the competitors blasted into the morning sun. Sam Sunderland had done his best to break the sands, but he was soon caught by Pablo Quintanilla. Austrian Matthias Volkner also caught up with the leading pair pretty quickly and the three ran together. But the question was, how was their pace in comparison to the second group? Buddying up and giving chase with the two Hondas of Gonsalves and Benavides and the second Husqvarna of Frenchman Pierre Alexandre René. Going nowhere was local Khalid Alpha C. A blown engine yesterday and now barely 10 kilometers into the stage, another problem. He was not the only one having a hard time of it. Dehydration and fatigue punishing the riders. It wasn't just the bikes having issue. Italian Camilla Lipriotti spent a while stuck in the dunes, desperate for a tow. I had a bike in front of me, uh, which slowed down, and I got stuck. So I tried to lift my quad, but it's too heavy, so I couldn't lift it. I had to wait for, for another quad. 
already under tow was Azamat Tulezov. He was thankful he'd been running close too, but then very much behind teammate Timo Baeziov. It was a better day for the two legends of the quad category, Kees Kulin and Raphael Sonic. They ran together, both having to make up time after problems on day one, and they were pushing as hard as they could. New to the quad category, Fahid Almaselam had a good day too, closing down the gap on overall Polish leader Kamil Wisniewski. Back in the bikes, the leading three riders had kept a slim advantage to finish together on the road, but the chasing duo of Pierre Alexandre René and Paolo Gonzalez were fastest through the stage. René just taking it. At the refueling, uh, I saw I was uh, not far from the, from the leader and uh, I tried to to catch him, uh, I make it was Paolo, I, I catch him and uh, at the end he, he go again a little bit but uh, with a three minute gap after the start uh, I'm in front of him so it's a good day. Sunderland had paid the price for going first and finished sixth overall. It's uh, been a tough day, um, I opened all 300 kilometres in the front and uh, it's always difficult in the dunes when you've got no line, um, you can't see, see so well. It's a bit frustrating, but we just got to keep working. Uh, I feel good, the bike's good, and uh, tomorrow's another day. Matthias Valkner provisionally took first overall, but a one minute penalty for speeding handed Consalves the overnight lead. Four minutes, 15 seconds, separating the top five riders after two stages. In the cars, the man to beat was Nasser Al Atiyah, setting off with over an 11 minute lead. The atmosphere in the cockpit is hot, but relaxed. Machu Bamel guides the Qatari through the sands. His Toyota visually looks different, sometimes almost floating over the most aggressive drops. The pace of the Toyota was looking hard to match. Even the Peugeot of Khalid al Qasimi looked spectacular, but sometimes cumbersome over the dunes in comparison. The close allegiance to Peugeot Sport through his WRC participation means Khalid has work support here running his 3008 and is learning every day the complexities of this amazing beast. Two-time winner of the event, Vladimir Vasiliev was running at speed when he managed to wedge himself in this small dip. Such was the force of the impact, the automatic emergency signal attracted the attention of Rally HQ and the medical evacuation team. Stand by, alarm, alarm. My team is voluntary, myself included. We come here, we give up our time and our skills to keep the competitors safe. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the reasons why the competitors like to do this event, because they know that if anything was to happen, they'd be well looked after. So people take a week off, come to the desert, whether they be trauma surgeon, anaesthetist, nurse, paramedic, um, and we band together as a team. People come year after year after year, they learn to work together as any trauma team would uh, in a district general hospital. I'm James McBride, uh, I'm a GP, uh, I live in Glasgow, I'm originally from Northern Ireland and uh, I've been uh, coming to these events for the last few years to, to volunteer uh, as part of the medical team, uh, search and rescue team for the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge and uh, it's really the, the, the love of, of cars that got me into it uh, in, at the start but I mean as a team, uh, the team keeps me coming back. Uh, we've got a great bunch of people here who are from all different disciplines. We've been doing it together for the last four or five years and you make bonds with those people. I mean, uh, we're like a big family out here, a big desert family. The Desert Challenge is, a, is, a, is an event that's unique to, to a lot of others and I mean it's called the Desert Challenge because it really is a challenge. Um, anybody who has spent any time out here, it's a hostile environment, nothing lives here, nothing grows here. It really is treacherous, I mean people say oh it's a desert walk and you hit. There's no trees, there's no rocks really, but uh, you know if you hit this sand it's like hitting concrete. So that's any, any injury you can pick up really, if falling off a bike or, or landing heavily, and even in your seat without rolling, yeah, you get a lot of spine injuries, bone injuries and as I say dehydration then added to all that means that we, we, have, we, have, a busy, we have a busy few days out here. 
I mean, day, day to day we travel quite a big distance in the helicopters. Uh, we, we follow the rally routes. Um, there's three helicopters involved in this event, which are supplied to us by Abu Dhabi Aviation, thankfully. And uh, we, we, we move about depending on where the competitors are. Everything is tracked. We're generally spread throughout the field, ready to react. Basically, when we arrive on a scene, we assess the situation, pick up the driver, like, like any paramedics or pre-hospital team would do. And uh, we, we make an assessment, and we make a decision of whether we take them to hospital, our local hospitals here, or, or whether we take them back to the medical center. With the three helicopters, it gives us good options because we can run multiple incidences at once, which uh, means that we're, we're covering safely the whole field, which is, which is great. And it's reassuring to the competitors, and it's reassuring to us that we're doing a good job when we're here. The experience of pre-hospital medicine is quite different to working in a hospital where you have a pre-packaged patient delivered to you by the ambulance staff. It's a skill set that helps and I think complements the, the hospital medicine. Several of my team are now very much more comfortable when the paramedics bring a patient in with an ambulance. They understand what the paramedics have been through in the rain, in the cold, in the heat, in the difficult uh, circumstances of an upturned car in a ditch. They have a lot more respect for the pre-hospital staff because they've done that job. So there are advantages all around. The Russian G Energy team would eventually make it back to the bivouac, but they wouldn't make another start line. The Russian team's misfortune was to the benefit of Mohammed Abu Issa as he moved up another place in T1. Having spent much of his 2016 doing military service in Qatar, he's not had huge amounts of time behind the wheel of the Mini. But this was a day for an opportunist, and Mo was exactly that. as was Martin Prokop with his Ford F-150. He was running fast and faultless. There is a lot of work the Czech driver needs to do to master his new car and discipline, but survival was the key, and today he was doing just that. Another Czech, Miroslav Zapatel, should have taken advantage in the Hummer. Running well, he was on course for a top three spot until accelerating into the dunes. He came to a standstill. It would be a long afternoon of digging for himself and co-driver Marek Sikora. World Cup leader Aaron Domazla was having his first real taste of dunes after success in the frozen lakes of Russia in round one of the FIA Cross Country World Cup. But the heat had got to him and he decided to pull his Toyota off rally route at PC3, taking the road home. Many more did the same. Ahmed al Makoudi would take huge penalties for missing the last part of the stage. As would T2 class leader and works Nissan driver Emil Kessner. The 48 degree temperatures in the dunes just too much for even some of the locals. At the finish though, Nasser al looked happy with his day's work, pulling a further 11 plus minutes ahead of the Peugeot. You know, it was really very, very difficult and uh slow suction a lot you know and uh, there is no high speed uh, road but okay we enjoy a lot and i think we we make a good uh, time also you know and uh, our toyota and uh, everything working very well and uh, yeah we we was really uh, uh, careful today because it was very uh, very dangerous uh, it was a very tough day uh, we had the big problems on the, the very soft sand. We had to do a lot of loops. Uh, we were struggling, but we tried to carry uh, a balanced momentum, so we tried to avoid the, the bad places. With the Russian G Energy team out of the rally, the Czech team MP Sports moves up into third, 35 minutes behind second place Abu Dhabi Racing, while Nasser al is 23 minutes ahead. Two excruciating days and 45 plus Celsius heat had taken its toll. But the rally wasn't even at its halfway stage. A race it might be, but an endurance challenge it certainly was. Three more days of this would separate the winners from the rest. Welcome back to the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, a battle through some of the most inhospitable terrains racing machines could face. 
The Al Ain Water Stage 3 of this year's Desert Challenge could well prove to be the trickiest. The 280-kilometre passage would take the teams down some nasty tracks and into the truly towering dunes of the UAE and along the border with Saudi Arabia. The day brought stronger winds, but also lower temperatures, dropping overnight by 10 degrees, which was a blessed relief for all. Never had 37 degrees Celsius felt so welcome by so many. The Austrian Matthias Falkner was one of the few who hadn't been too affected by the heat. From the hot, I feel quite okay because we have an average around like 80, I think, so it cooled down. The wind, of course, when you get stuck sometimes in the dunes, is, is, is like really hard, but I really try to, to drink how much as is possible and this helps a lot. Relative newcomer Pierre Alexandre René opened the road, but he would never have it easy, especially with so much experience behind. It's not that the Husqvarna man is a slow rider, far from it, but in cross-country rallying there's so much more to do. Read the terrain and the roadbook, work out where the next waypoint is and avoid all of the looming dangers. Riding the bike is just one skill needed to bring you to the top of this game. Like the previous days, the field of top riders compressed. Consalves was second on the road and first to catch leader René. Next up, Matthias Valkner had been so far consistent, but not as razor fast as he was before he broke his femur a few years back. He is part of this new generation of KTM stars, but now the only non-Dakar victor, and would love to find a way to take victory from this event. Pablo Quintanilla is the best place to fight the KTM boys hard. The Chilean has always placed well on the Desert Challenge, but is yet to take a win and Team Husqvarna would love to take some of the glory away from the orange KTMs. Not least from Sam Sundland, who he beat to the World Championship overall last year. Remember, Sam may be 2017 Dakar champion, but is yet to win this home event. No one was yet stamping their authority. For the local favourite, Mohamed Al-Balushi, his slow prologue time had put him on the back foot and the wrong piece of sand compared to the fastest guys. However, he was still running best of the rest behind the works riders and was pushing all the way. It may have not been Kevin Benavidi's year either. The works Honda rider broke down in the latter part of the stage and had a long wait before he and his bike could be recovered. 12 minutes separate the leading five bikes with top UAE rider Belushi in seventh and Vendetta Racing's David McBride in eighth. Back at the Adnock refueling station, bikes and quads were still arriving and with a lot of flammable liquids around and competitors keen to fuel quickly, fire is a hazard. Well, the Desert Challenge is a relatively new project for us. This is our second year supporting the event. We feel privileged to be chosen as the service provider to look after fire and rescue safety here. And the challenges that we face in the desert are similar to the challenges that the actual drivers and racers face as well. Extreme conditions, difficult terrain. Our vehicles are designed to cope with that. These vehicles do pose very special challenges to us as a fire and rescue service. They are bespoke individual vehicles. Simple things like locating the batteries, the type of fuel tanks, where they're located, the difficulty of entering the vehicle, the different types of suspension units and so pose a problem in the event of a fire involving. So they are very difficult. And when the staff are there, our staff make full use of the time to go around the vehicles, talk to the engineers and the mechanics to find out the different vehicles and what challenges they may present to us as well. Such a shame Keith Coolen had had such a poor first day because the Dutchman would have been right at the front of the quad category after another super fast stage. He started alone in the first batch of 15 riders, which meant a lonely but fast day. Raphael Sonic was in the same boat and seemed to have fixed his fueling issues to have another enjoyable ride in the dunes. As someone native to Poland, the 50 plus degree temperatures the first two days were not welcome, but day three wins were much more to his liking. His pace put him back in the lead of the quad category. Peruvian Alexis Ponche also had a great ride, finishing third of the day. Whilst Guatemalan Rodolfo Shippers had fought through two days of illness at the start of the week, be within 10 minutes of the quad leader, a truly remarkable story was emerging in the class. Sonic had a slim two-minute lead ahead of teammate Wisniewski, 
with Al Masalam in third and Shippers under four minutes off the lead in fourth. Whilst the bikes were relatively happy over the dunes of the empty quarter, the cars were not. Even the best cars were getting caught out. Aaron de Mozzola in the Toyota managed to get stuck eight times during the day. Yaya El Heli wasn't one of the cars having issues though. With 27 desert challenges under his belt, he knows how to handle the dunes. Nevertheless, the safety teams are never far away. The sweep teams are a vital part of the of the rally uh, in, in cross-country championships. Because of the nature of the terrain, uh, because of the harshness of the event, it's mechanically hard, it's physically hard. Uh, competitors sometimes just physically can't compete a race. They, uh, they break their cars, their bikes, they can't you know, mechanically get through. So we have the sweet teams there to make sure that nobody gets left out in the middle of nowhere on the road. Uh, so these guys are very, very uh, experienced, highly professional uh, officials uh, who are experts in off-road driving and vehicle recovery. It just means that as the event moves through, we don't leave a, a, a trail of destruction behind us and we bring everybody back out uh, of the desert and get them back to their crews uh, each and every night. Is it a car or a bike? Nobby, go with him and we'll follow. Yeah, so we just had a uh, car who's rolled, um, so it's actually quite a serious incident. So obviously the helicopter will be on the way um, as a backup. We're going to be making best speed to get there with the medic that we have on board in the car. We're two and a half kilometers away and we'll make best speed to, uh, to get to the driver. Germany's Stefan Schott was running in sixth place at the Maurip Hill when he flipped his mini all four racing on the tallest dune around. A serious roll ensued. Thankfully, neither Schott nor co-driver Andreas Schultz were injured and they would fight another day though their car had some serious damage, and it would take some great work from the sweep teams to recover it back to the bivouac, where a long night of repairs would ensue. The close bond between the competitors and rescue crews was clear to see. How many times do I win to shoot back onto your wheels? Three. Okay, get your jacks again this time. Huh? Okay, so when this car two-ton rolled, they've obviously gone over a couple of times. It's broken the rear uh, drive shaft, so they've got no rear drive. The wheel is also the rear wheel is also out of alignment. So as we're trying to winch and drive the car backwards, the brake caliper is catching the wheel. So now we're going to try and disconnect the brake caliper, hopefully free the wheel, and then see what sort of motion he's got. Worst case scenario, we're going to try and tow him out into Marib June. There is nowhere on earth that has remote, literally, apart from maybe Antarctica. Um, and we have a response time better than New York, London, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Sydney, it doesn't matter where. Um, and that's because of the traffic system we have now, uh, because of the teams we have, that they're so well drilled and we all work so well together that we can go out and, and perform these rescues. Sorry to keep you waiting, mate. <laughs> the car to have in the massive dunes is the remarkable Polaris. On the flats, they do lack a little bit of speed compared to the larger engine cars and trucks, but Ahmed al Makudi was showing he could mix it with the best, fastest on this stage, but teammate Michel Fidel remains ahead in the overall standings. With larger names struggling, it was a chance for some of the giant killers. And whilst two wheels drive doesn't sound ideal, the Saluki of Mark Powell crawled effectively through the dunes. It wasn't without incident, but the green machine kept momentum to move to seventh overall. Khalid al Farey had a fantastic day to take his T1 Nissan Patrol into the top five overall for the sixth place finish. And desert experience counted for everything when this awesome Silverado of Khalid al Jafla, despite losing most of its bodywork, managed third position in the stage. The vehicle is designed for side-by-side -side racing in America but clearly it's just as at home in the Abu Dhabi desert. Schaffler was faster than the Ford F-150 of Martin Prokop after the Czech briefly found himself stuck in the sands, but no penalty means he is still well up in the overall leaderboard. It was a tricky day for all. Sheikh Khalid al Qasimi was occasionally struggling in the softer dunes, but he was still charging through some of the other sections, keeping the chasing pack at bay. 
almost certainly the only man not to have to get out of his car and dig was Nasser Al Atiyah, once again the class above the rest of the field. The overdrive Toyota may be a great car, but Nasser is doing a wonderful job. The gap is uh, coming big and big, you know, just we try uh, next two days, you know, to be easy and uh, to reach the finish. His lead of over 39 minutes is starting to look unassailable, with a third place Ford nearly two hours behind. Could anybody close the gap? It may seem that for the teams, the worst was over. But with two days and nearly 500 more steel breaking and bone crunching kilometers left, anything could happen. This is, after all, the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. Welcome back to the empty quarter in the United Arab Emirates. Some of the best endurance motorsport competitors on the planet have been doing battle all week across hundreds of kilometers of the rolling dunes. But the focus now is on the final two days. The penultimate Adnock stage took the teams back through the giant sand hills of the Liwa Desert with a similar routing to the day before. The teams were expecting to face many similar issues. Sunderland would again lead the group into another early morning across the northern part of the region. He knew today he would probably lose time to at least the four behind and therefore almost certainly the overall lead, but strategy was becoming a key factor. Indeed, Pablo Quintanilla had already taken a minute from the Brit in the first 80 kilometers, with the chasing three riders not far behind. Rene, Valkner and finally Consalves, who brushed this little moment off before getting back to chase the leaders down. The desert could be a lonely place, so Kevin Benavides would have benefited and enjoyed the companionship of Kuwaiti Mohamed Jafar, who was having his best stage aboard his KTM. They would ride together for the rest of the day, pushing each other hard. Australian Lee Stevens was clearly enjoying his day aboard the KTM 500. Very happy with his riding, finishing 10th fastest. At the finale of leg four though, the top five bikes had grouped together and this was when the seconds could be made or lost, crucial for the final classification. Any mistakes from them would be catastrophic, yet the speed was astounding. They would once again finish the stage together, meaning René was the fastest, followed by Gonzalez, Valkner, Sunderland and Quintanilla. Today I, I start in front, so I knew from the beginning it would be a not so good day. So we try to play some strategy for tomorrow to, to have advantage in the last day, because tomorrow I start behind, so I have the possibility to recover some time, so it's good for me. But it would be Benavides who would set the best time, a great comeback after his problems on stage three. Gonsalves had a small overall lead going into the final day, but just 90 seconds covers the top five after over a thousand kilometers of racing. Sunderland sitting fourth, but due to leave eighth in the race, giving him the best chance of victory overall. In the quads, it was another good day for Peru's Alexis Hernandez Ponche, who took the stage victory, but in quite a remarkable turn of events, with a second fastest stage time, Rodolfo Schippers took the lead of the rally. And when he arrived at the end of the stage, the effort and joy was clear to see. Nasser Alatir and Mathieu Bommel's lead ahead of stage four looked ever increasingly unassailable as he confidently took once again to the dunes. Things were not going so well for his rival in the Peugeot. A drive shaft issue before PC2 had left him stationary for a while and he had to dig as well, but he was making good time up at the end of the stage. It doesn't help that the rivalry between the two teams has been fierce for years. Neither likes being beaten by the other, whether it be in WRC or the desert. It was becoming clear though, NASA needed to push no more. His position, completely unbeatable. In the production class, Emil Kessner took the stage victory, but was hampered in the overall standings by an eight hour time penalty for missing part of stage two. Saudi driver Ahmed Al Shigawi hadn't finished outside the top two all week and therefore had a firm grip on the overall title with a 48 minute lead from his teammate Yasir Sedan. 
the T3 class, Al Makudi had gained back earlier lost penalty time against the rest of the field, and after a second good day in a row, guiding his Polaris to the finish fastest, he was back on top of the leaderboard. However, the stage was not plain sailing for all. The sun was back out, and picking out the gradient of the dunes was proving tricky. Khalid El Jaffa's home-built Chevrolet-based vehicle was having a run of its life despite still missing most of its front end and now lost even more bodywork from the rear. He would still take a career-best second at the finish. WRC expert Martin Prokop enjoyed a day-long fight with fellow countryman Miroslav Zapatel, the Hummer spectacular over the flatter sections, but the Ford still better in the sands. Prokop would end the day within 35 minutes of Al Qasimi's second position, but at the top, only a disaster would stop Nasser and Machu from retaining their Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge title. It's never uh, been uh, comfortable, you know, but okay, uh, we try to, to work day by day, you know. Uh, we did really uh, four days of uh, Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge, uh, fantastic, no mistake, no stack, you know. And still we have one day uh, left and we try to do our best for uh, winning this uh, Desert Challenge. This is a huge event, one that couldn't take place without the enormous contribution of all the staff involved, the vast majority of which are unpaid volunteers. We've got great volunteers and the volunteers here who, who, who come out to work for seven days non-stop in pretty tough conditions. They've got to take, take a week off work, they've got to take a week leave of absence from, from their jobs and they join us here as one big huge family. Uh, to put this this whole thing together, about 300 people actually to coordinate the whole event here. Mohammed bin Salem, the the owner and the founder and the president of ATC UAE, we can't do it on our own. We've got to depend on all these great volunteers that we have. Uh, my name is Evgeny. I'm from Russia, and we are here on the Finnish post for the last three years with a wonderful event, Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge. It's absolutely amazing community. You may found here the friends from all around the world. This is very friendly environment and community. I'm proud of them. And they are as a, uh, to me as a family. And we are in um, debt to them. Uh, they have been here for a long time and they have been associated with the Desert Challenge, Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge for a long time. So, and um, they are committed, but they are professionals also. The final Abu Dhabi Aviation Stage 5 arrived. A 234 kilometer dash north, back out of the bigger dunes with a flat sprint to the finish. The scene was set for a dramatic showdown in the bikes. A fascinating five-way battle was in prospect. Sam Sunderland started eighth and 21 minutes behind the first away. His objective was to push to catch as many of his competitors as possible, and he knew his nearest rival for the title would be Pablo Quintanilla, so if he could see him on the horizon, victory should be his. But Quintanilla had a similar mindset. He started six minutes up the road, but still with plenty of tracks to follow. The Chilean should have been able to keep the gap to Sunderland over the shorter stage. Out front, such was the pace set by Argentine Kevin Benavides that he and Paolo Gonzalez, the two Hondas, were ahead on the road, but strategically they needed a miracle if they were even going to snatch a podium. Their pace wasn't fast enough. Having finished, they watched the clock and for Sunderland and Quintanilla to make their appearance. When they arrived together, Sam having started so far behind, it was clear that he would be the stage winner and the 2017 Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge champion. Another dramatic fight was in store for the quads. In fact, with one minute and 40 seconds between new boy Fahid al Masalam and Rodolfo Shippers, that was the fight to watch. Mixed in with the bikes, Shippers would set off four minutes ahead of his rival. He had to push as hard as he could all the way to the line, but the quad failed on him. When Al Masalam crossed the finishing line, having passed a static Shippers halfway into the stage, he too knew that history was being written as the first Kuwaiti rider to win the Desert Challenge. So Sunderland finished up with a seemingly comfortable six-minute lead over Quintanilla, though the times don't really tell the full story. Valkman took the third step of the podium, with Gonsalves the best Honda in four. NASA had been joking about taking a picnic into the dunes, such was his massive advantage, and he looked suitably relaxed as he started off towards victory. Not far into the start of the stage, during a fast section, 
all seemed calm in the cockpit. The impact had been huge. Everyone seemed okay. Amazingly, the car was still running and they started to limp to the finish. The pace was dreadfully slow, but they did have that two hour advantage. Because of his disappointing stage four, Shane Khalid started way back and therefore hadn't seen the wreckage of NASA's Toyota. So he was pushing on, resigned to second position. He couldn't back off though, because 30 minutes stuck in a dune would cost him that second spot. The F-150 of Martin Prokop looked better and better in the dunes each day, and once again he was locked in that battle, trying to outpace his countryman Zapatel. In the T2s, Ahmed al Sagawi had a 48-minute lead, but got stuck in the sand, and by the end, Yasir Sedan had overtaken him and taken the overall lead and victory by 25 minutes. In the T3 category, Ahmed al makoudis consistency meant he passed Michel Fidel in the stage and cruised to another title. At PC1 though, Nasser al engine had enough and the Qatari was pulled out of the stage, his hopes of victory gone. The news had filtered back to the finishing line and as Sheikh Khalid al Qasimi crossed the line, they knew against all odds he had taken an incredible victory, the very first local winner the car category. Martin Prokop improved all week and therefore took second, ahead of Qatar's Mohamed Abu Issa, who took the final podium spot. As race proceedings wound down, all of the competitors made their way back to Abu Dhabi to where it all began at the Yas Marina circuit. A chance for the winners to be given the recognition and applause they deserved. Really happy the bike and the team were perfect all week and we had a tough fight, you know, it looks easy on paper, the strategy and things, but really it's uh, not so easy when you're out there, you know, we had really hot temperatures the first days, it was around 50 degrees and a lot of people were suffering, including myself, And uh, but yeah, it went well, you know, um, didn't really make any mistakes and um, today I started behind, which was the plan and had to, had to push a lot to catch the time back and it all worked out, so really happy. The good thing because it is in Abu Dhabi and because the team is Abu Dhabi team and because the driver, myself, presenting Abu Dhabi in the global motorsport as a sport ambassador, one day rally. So we have a lot of credits today. We have many credits, the team, myself. It's good for Abu Dhabi, it's good for the event itself, good for the sport. The organizer's president, Mohammed bin Salayam, was happy with another great edition of the event. I'm happy with the, with the result. You know, the, 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 what you hear from the competitors when they said, we do not have to ask them to come and buy them, they say, see you next year. That's, I'm not looking for appreciation, only recognition is enough. Celebrations carried on into the night at Yas Marina, a chance for all to share stories and experiences of an epic week. Over a thousand kilometers of the world's biggest sea sands had been raced over to decide this year's winner. Some had succumbed, some had triumphed. Through the hardest terrain, in the hottest of temperatures. One of the toughest challenges the world of motorsport has to offer, the Abu Dhabi Desert Challenge.